All right, Daddy, ready to get going? Okay. <laughs> Yeah, we're going to do the first song, then we'll have Pastor Susan come up and do announcements and then Pastor songs. Alright, you can just kind of walk and keep people in. Well, let me welcome you in. Uh, we're so glad that you are here. And um, uh, hopefully others will be able to come uh, a little bit later. I'm so glad to uh, look out and see you today. We want to sing to the Lord, and we had to kind of change a little bit of how we do that uh, because of where we are. I, I was telling Tyler, uh, Pastor Tyler, I don't believe in all of my uh, ministry career I have ever preached a sermon with the background of guns being fired off. <laughs> so uh, this is a cool experience to be able to, to uh, lead some singing. Thanks for coming out today. We're so glad you're here. I want to just lead in a brief word of prayer. You should have a song sheet, and the first song that we're singing together is Our God is Greater, okay? So, so that you know what order we're going in. So let's pray together just briefly, and then we'll begin to sing. Heavenly Father, we welcome uh, your presence among us here today. Thank you, Lord, for this opportunity. What a special day. What an exciting service, Lord, and we're so glad that we're here. We thank you, Father, for loving us with the, the everlasting love that you have, Lord, in your heart for people. And we're just so grateful that we belong to Jesus Christ. We pray, Father, that as we progress through this service, that the Holy Spirit will be so present among us that we will sense you, we will know you are with us. We pray that you will bless us, Lord. Bless in particular um, uh, Brooke as she is baptized later on. We just thank you, Lord, for this privilege and we praise you for what you're doing in the lives of people. Bless us as we sing now, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So get your song sheet, if you will. We'll sing together, Our God is Great.
Pastor Susan to come forward. She's going to share some announcements with you. <laughs> Dropped a couple feet. But anyway, look at the beautiful day. God gave us a beautiful day to just see his creation and be together. And we're so happy you guys are here. Amen. What a great celebration today is. So think about what's going to happen. In a couple weeks, we're going to go ahead and have, have the yard sale restore. So if you want to drop off any donations, do that about 7 o'clock. And um, from 7 to about 7.30, quarter of 8. And then we're going to do a sale from about 8 to 1. We also need volunteers. If anybody would like to help out with, your, with the yard sale, let us know. We need help packing up, cleaning up, and selling. So we would love all your help and to be able to do that. Also, too, uh, as we know, uh, children's ministry. Gary has been working to set up teachers and do a schedule and everything. So starting actually next Sunday, as Lord allows, we're going to go ahead and have <laughs> children's ministry. So what we're going to do is we're going to mandate masks for kids and for teachers. And um, he did a schedule, and so be praying for children's ministry. So if you'd like to bring your children, come downstairs, and we'll have teachers and assistants down there uh, to be able to teach the children about God. Also, too, uh, if you have musical talent, we would love for people to help play keyboard and do different things. Please see Pastor Ken. He's our worship leader, <laughs> and so if you have musical talent, please talk to him and belt it out, sing it, play it, whatever. Um, so we would love to have more people worshiping and serving in that kind of capacity. Also, too, on September 2nd, 12 to 3, is a community day for the social worker down the apartment complex. And so they're going to have a fun day with kids. And they asked if we would like to volunteer to help out doing cookout and being able to play good games with the kids and help clean up and stuff. So if you'd like to do that, let me know. And that's going to be on a Thursday at, um, at September 2nd. So let us worship the Lord. Thanks, everybody. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Pastor Susan, um, and appreciate that last announcement. Yes, if you have musical gifts, I would love to talk to you and get you helping us out. Um, it would be wonderful to have your help. I want us to sing a couple more songs in worship this morning. You have them on your song sheet. I love this first song, and it's a real opportunity for us to think about how privileged we are. You know, sometimes I know the word privilege is being thrown around in a political sense, but I will tell you, I know I'm privileged because I belong to Jesus Christ. Amen. It's an honor to know God. It's an honor to be his child. And so I, I, the sentiments of this song, who, uh, who you say I am, uh, just bless me. And this is a real opportunity for us out of hearts of gratitude to express to God how thankful we are that we are who God says we are, not who others say we are. Amen. Aren't you glad for that today? That God, who knows us perfectly, loves us. And, and uh, I can't even describe to you how much he loves us, but he does. So let's sing this song together. And as you can see in the first song, I may vary from what's written on the sheet. Just listen to my verbal cues. And if <laughs> I get lost, I get lost, okay? But let's sing this song. Let's worship the Lord together. Yes, I am. Here we 
go. Let's sing it. I am chosen. I am chosen, not forsaken. I am who you say I am. You are for me, not against me. I am who you say I am. I am chosen, not forsaken. I am who you say I am. You are for me, not against me. I am who you say I am. Yes, I am who you say I am. Who the sun sets free, or is free in me. I'm a child of child of God, yes I am, in my Father's house, in my Father's house, there's a place for me, I'm a child of God, yes I am, one more time, I'm a child of God, I'm a child of God, yes I am that good truth today. Amen. You belong to the Lord and you are who he says you are. Let's sing this last song together about the king of our heart. Let's make this a prayer to the Lord. Let the king of my heart be the mountain where I run, the fountain I drink from, oh, is my song. Let the king of my heart. <laughs> Sorry, guys, I, we got to get the music. The <laughs> Let hold me it, hold it for you, buddy. <laughs> All right, we're going to get the second. Uh, All right, let's see. Let me see where we are here. Here. <laughs> oh, okay. no, no, no. We're not even doing good. Let's Hold start. On. We'll start over. We'll start it again. I'll, I'll take the mic over there. All right. My apologies. <laughs> the wind is not cooperating with us. All right. Let's try this again, make it. You guys are doing so well. That sounded great. <laughs> That's the practice run. Let the king of my heart be the mountain where I run, the fountain I drink from, oh, he is my song. Let the king of my heart be the shadow where I hide, the ransom for my life, oh, he is my song, cause you are good. Good. Oh, oh, yes, you are good, good. Oh, 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 you are good, good. Oh, you are good, good. Oh, oh, oh. and let the king of my heart be the wind. Let the king of my heart be the fire inside my veins, the echo of my days, oh, he is my song. Let the king of my heart be the wind inside my sails, and in my heart, oh, he is my song. Let the king of my heart be the fire inside my veins, the echo of my days, oh, he is my song, cause you are good, good, oh, yes, you are good, good, oh, you are good. the 
this heart. You're never gonna let, you're never gonna let me down. And you're never gonna let, you're never gonna let me down. You're never gonna let, you're never gonna let me down. No, you're never gonna let, you're never gonna let me down. But you are good, good. God, we thank you that this is who you are. And Lord, we want the king of our heart to, uh, to be all that we have just sung about, the wind in our sails. We want you to be everything to us, oh God. We pray, Father, that you will bless the remainder of our time together as my son preaches your word, that you would fill him with the Holy Spirit, that you would bless the baptism upcoming. We just thank you for this privilege to worship you. There is no God like you. Father, when we came here, we all came with our own set of concerns, and some of us came with real tough situations on our heart. And Lord God, here's what we know. There is nothing greater than you, and nothing that, you, that rattles or upsets you. Father, there is nothing that you can't deal with. So we're asking for your presence, and we're asking for miracles today. And we're asking, oh God, that you would know the thoughts and, and the, the things that are on our minds. And that, Father, you would address our needs. You know what we came in with. You know, Lord God, uh, what's going on in our lives perfectly. You know that person who uh, is struggling so hard and has come in. And, Father, perhaps doing their very best to hold it together. I ask, Father, that you would be their rock, their strong tower today. Pray for that one who feels the closest to you and seems like um, they're on a mountaintop, that you would bless them in that place of, of rejoicing and rest. And I pray for the one in the deep valley today and ask you, oh God, to be ever present in their time of trouble. You know the sick, you know the needs, Lord, of our church. You know, Lord God, about the transitions we're going through. And so we place all of this in the capable hands of our mighty God. And we pray in the matchless name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you guys so much for joining us in worship today. And thank you, Dad, for helping hold my music for me. <laughs> it is uh, and kind of ironic that when it got windy, we're talking about the wind in my sails. So God is singing right along with us today. And uh, I always do look forward to this service. I uh, how, how often do I get to preach in flip-flops? We could have branded this as gunfire and flip-flops. That could have been a fun, fun service. Uh, but I, I always look forward to this service. Uh, and I've been thinking this week a lot about baptism, of course, as this is the Sunday, the time of the year where we come together and, and we celebrate what we do when we come together and we baptize someone. And I'm so excited for Brooke and what an amazing thing it is for her to do today. And I was just thinking about how kind of weird baptism kind of is, honestly. Like when you think about what we're actually doing, we're all gathering around to watch me and Pastor Susan dunk Brooke in water. Like that's kind of a weird thing, isn't it? Like it, it really is. Uh, if I just described that event to someone like, hey, would you like to come watch me dunk someone in the water? They'd be like, no. Uh, but, but we come here together and, and, and there's something special about it. But I don't know about you. Uh, I submerge myself in water all the time, but nothing special happens there. I do that when I get a bath or when I get a shower. And so there, there's nothing magical about the act of putting ourselves underwater. When we go swimming, we go underwater and we come back up and nothing magical happens there. But yet baptism is this thing that we, that we come together for, that we're instructed to do. And maybe it would say we, we get baptized because the Bible tells us to, and that's a good answer. But I think that there's a reason God chooses to do it this way. There's a reason why baptism isn't this thing that you do by yourself in the bathtub. There's a reason why you, why you do it in front of other believers, other people that love you and care for you. 
Because what's, what's, what's amazing in the transformation isn't about the actual process of being dunked in the water, but the transformation happens when you, in front of God, in front of your church, in front of your friends, in front of your family, pronounce to the world, God has done something Amen. in my life. And there's something, that, uh, something amazing that happens in that moment when we show to the world what God is doing on the inside and we come together and we say, although I may not be done, although I may not be perfect and God has a long way to go in changing my life as he still does for all of us here, I belong to God. Amen. And that's what it really is about. Because I, I think sometimes people can get kind of tripped up on the idea of baptism or let alone going to church on, on this thought, oh, uh, my life is too much of a mess to get baptized. My life is too much of a mess to go to church. And, and I, I've used this analogy before. That's like someone saying, I'm not in shape enough to go to the gym. No, you got that all wrong. You go to the gym to get in shape. <laughs> you, you go to church because you want, you can, the uh, only way to truly transform is with the power of God is what the Holy Spirit enters your life. And that's one of the things I love about baptism. It's this moment where we say, yes, God, I am imperfect, but I want to be more like you. Amen. I think really what it is, is it's a matter of integrity. It's a matter of us telling the world what's, uh, what God is doing on the inside and pronouncing to everyone, I belong to God. It makes me think in, the, in Psalms chapter 15, something David said, Lord, who may dwell in your sacred tent, who may live in the holy mountain, the one, who walk, the one whose walk is blameless, who does what is righteous, who speaks the truth from their heart, whose tongue utters no slander, who does no wrong to a neighbor and casts no slurs on others, who lends money to the poor without interest, who does not accept a bride against the innocent, whoever does these things will not be shaken. I love there what David is describing is, is a person of integrity, a person who follows after God, someone who would say, you know what, even when things may be more convenient for me to lie or to cheat, I won't do those things because I, uh, because I want to be the person that God has called me to be. And I love the promise that it says at the end of that, whoever does these things will never be shaken. And I think that's one of, the, one of the amazing things that God does for us when we live our lives with a life of integrity. We, don't, we aren't shaken by the same things that other people might be worried about or have to fear because we're living the way God's called us to live. But I think the sad thing is we live in a time where people are probably more surprised by integrity than when someone has a moral failing. Isn't that true? Uh, I remember this one time I was out, uh, I was going to the mall and I was walking by and, and I saw a wallet on the ground and I picked it up and there was a lot of money in the wallet. I'm a little ashamed to tell you what my first thought was. I just made a lot of money and I was like, yes! I was like, I'm at the mall, gonna buy myself something fun. My, my first thought was not, oh, I should make sure this wallet gets back to someone. It probably really matters to them. And I had this little, a little uh, 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 voice in my head say, hey, that doesn't belong to you. You should try to return it. And then I said to the boys, finders, keepers, losers, weepers. Uh, and then I had a little back and forth uh, with, with that inner, uh, with my conscience, with God, and then real quickly decided, okay, I need to do the right thing and I need to at least try to return it. So uh, I, I was able to figure out that person's information and give them a call. And you, I can't believe how shocked they were that I called them after finding their wallet. And so I set up a time to return their wallet to this person. And then I gave the wallet to them and they looked down and then they started to cry. I think what they thought what was gonna happen is that I or someone else took all the money and I was nice enough to return the credit cards and the driver's license to them. And that person just started to cry and said, I never thought I was gonna get this money back. And I had no idea how I was gonna pay my rent without all of this money. And I, in that moment, first of all, felt terrible that I ever even thought about keeping the money. But secondly, I thought, how sad is it that people are more surprised when people do the right thing than when people do the wrong thing? But I mean, we, we turn on the news 
And it's one moral failure after another. Our political leaders, athletes, uh, uh, politicians, just, uh, we, we look at church leaders and pastors. We see it in maybe our own families. And we see it time and time and time again where people who we put our hope and we put our trust into fall short of the things that we know that they should be doing. And so we're no longer surprised. But today I want to continue to talk about that and look at how it is that we can live a life full of integrity and how what's on the inside can match what's on the outside. Well, first I want to define what, I, what integrity isn't. Perfection. Who in here is a perfect person and never makes any mistakes? Okay, good. No one rose their hand because if you did, you would be a liar. So, so you wouldn't be a person of integrity. But I think here's the issue. We think a lot of times to be a person of integrity means we can't make mistakes, but that's not true at all. I don't think I, I don't think it requires us to never make mistakes, to never do something, to never do something. And go, oh my goodness, that was terrible. I, I think instead it means something slightly different. The word integrity in Latin it means whole, an integrated life, is really what it means. It means it means like if you think of your life as like a as as like a pie chart. And you have the professional pie slice and the family pie slice and the social pie slice and the spiritual and the private. And you look at all of these different things that, compo that compose your life. As you look at all of that, if you can say, I am the same person whether I'm at work or at church or in my home or with my friends. I'm the same person on a Sunday morning as I am on a Friday night. That's a person of integrity. And then there's this other issue that we kind of mix this up with. Does that mean I need to act the same in all times of my life? And my answer is no. Okay, for instance, when I talk to a baby, I use a certain voice. And I go, oh, hi, how are you? Now, if I use that same voice when I talk to you guys, you would be like, don't wait to the end of the month, pastor. You can leave now. You know, like, that's really creepy. We don't do that. If I used my phone voice, all the time, my wife would never talk to me. You know, like there, it's okay to act, uh, to act and to behave according to what is going on. For instance, if you are a real introvert, but you are in a job that requires you interact with people, you should probably still interact with people. When you're at your home, it is fine to be introverted. It doesn't mean we have to act literally the same at all the times, but how I would define it, integrity is when your behavior matches your beliefs. And sometimes your beliefs call you to act differently in different situations. For sometimes showing God's love to someone is going out of my comfort zone and, and talking and being bubbly when I don't feel like being bubbly. And other times for someone who maybe is someone who is a really bubbly talkative person, it means being quiet and listening. Being a person of integrity doesn't mean you always have to act the same, but it means that your actions are always, are always dictated by the beliefs that you hold in your heart. And I think if we understand that, it's a lot easier to see whether or not we are being a person of integrity. Because I can know how to act good, but if my reasons for acting good are not valid and good reasons, if it's selfish, that's not being a person of an integrity. That's just trying to, to trick people. Proverbs 10, 9 says, Whoever walks in integrity walks securely, but whoever takes a crooked path will be found out. Has anyone in here, I bet I'll see some hands this time, ever done something wrong? And have you ever hoped that people would not find out about the thing that you did that was wrong? Who has ever laid up late at night thinking, oh my goodness, I really hope they don't find out about the thing that I did, which was wrong. It's like the thing, you know, you, it feels good in the moment to do the thing you're not supposed to do. Like if a friend asks you to move and you're like, moving is a terrible thing. By the way, thanks to everyone who helped me load up the truck. You guys are awesome. And, and it may feel good to come up with some like crazy excuse for why you can't do it. But then at night you're going, oh man. I really hope they don't find out that that wasn't true and you're worried about that. But on the flip side, have you ever laid up at night worried that someone will find out that you did the right thing? You're like, oh my goodness, what if they find out that I filed that expense report correctly? What are they going to do if they found out that I held that door for that old lady? What's going to happen if they realize I told the truth? No, never once. You don't have to do that when you do what is right. When you do the things that you're supposed to do, you don't have to walk around being worried and being stressed 
Being a, living a life of integrity is when our private life is consistent, not the same, but consistent with your public life. If, this, if the same beliefs that dictate how we act in public are how we act when no one is around, that's what it means. Because there's a difference between reputation and integrity. Reputation is who others think I am. Integrity is who you really are. Because it is easy, it can be easy to fool people on the outside. It can be easy to put on a good face. It can be easy to have a good reputation. I think it is a lot harder, but it is so worthwhile to try to be a person of integrity, not just a person of reputation. What is the opposite of integrity? That's to be a, a hypocrite. And that literally means an actor in a play. How many times have we been an actor in a play? And we're trying to make other people think that we're someone that we're not. And I was thinking about this week, who is it that Jesus was the hardest on in his time on the earth? He wasn't hardest on the prostitutes. He wasn't hardest on the adulterers. He wasn't hardest on the tax collectors. Everyone knew their sin. Everyone saw what they were doing and they did not pretend to be something that they were not. You know who he was hardest on? The Pharisees. He was hardest on the people who put on this big play and tried to look as righteous and as holy as they could. He was hardest on the people who, who, tried, to use, who tried to use their religion like a shield and like a sword to batter other people down and to build themselves up. Those were the people who he came down on hardest. On Matthew 23, it says, Woe to you, teachers of the law, and Pharisees, you hypocrites, you clean the outside of the cup and dish, but inside you are full of greed and self-indulgence. Self uh, uh, Blind Pharisee, first clean the inside of the cup and dish, and then the outside will also be clean. And this makes me think of this thing that I, I've seen in the church, and it's where people try to clean up all their behaviors before they try to fix what's in their heart. And they try to get all their actions right so they can feel like they can fit in church before they fix what's in their heart. We can fake it for a while. I can pretend to be someone I am not for a certain amount of time. But if I don't fix the underlying issue that's causing me to be angry, that's causing me to be selfish, if I don't fix the underlying problem, at the end of the day, I'm still just that dirty dish. The outside may look beautiful but it's what on the inside eventually is going to show what's on the outside. And that's what, that's what can happen. And it's not what the others see that matters. It's, one, it's what's on the inside. Think about how, think about there, there, there's this builder and it's the end of his career. And he gets convinced to do one more job, but he doesn't really want to do it. And so he cuts corners and he, he just he, he hires everything out to other contractors, but he does it begrudgingly and he doesn't use very nice materials, but he makes sure on the outside it looks beautiful. And that home may be gorgeous. But then real quickly you find out that all those corners that were cut led to a home that is absolutely falling apart but may look really nice on the outside. The thing is that we're building our own home with our actions. And we can build up our reputation and make the outside look great and have wonderful landscaping and make everything look great. But by every decision that we make, we're building the home that we live in. By the way that we act and by the way that we live, we're building the home, our very own home. And I don't wanna cut corners in my life because we can be generous or we can be selfish. We can do what's right or we can cut corners. We can show honor to other people, or we can try to, or we can tear others down. We can extend grace to others, or we can judge harshly. We can tell the truth, or we can tell the story in the way that benefits us. And as we're doing all of these things, we're building our very own home. But we're also building a legacy. We're building a legacy that our kids, that our family, that our friends are going to see and in one way or another, they may even inherit. And for anyone who's a parent, you've seen how some of your own actions and the things you dislike about yourself the most, you see in your kids. And then you realize what that's doing to them. I heard someone once say that the fastest way to raise rebellious kids is to claim one thing and to live another. Because they see. 
And we can only fake it for so long, but I think at the end of the day, the truth will come out. But I want to ask you, what is your integrity worth to you? What's it worth to you? And that's, that's an interesting question to ask. And maybe you can come up in your mind uh, what you feel like it's worth. Maybe you could even put, give it a dollar figure. I, I would hope to say, I hope you say it's worth a lot. But then I was starting to think through some of the things that we may do at the expense of our integrity. How many times you've heard of someone lying, on, lying to get a job? How many times have you? Uh, how many times have you heard, or have you ever? Have you ever falsified an expense report, or cheated on an exam when you were in school? Who's ever lied about a kid's age to get a discount admission? It's like when you think about it, some of those things don't have a lot of value. It's like, yeah, you saved eight dollars, but that was at the expense of your integrity. And all these little things that other people may not see, but yet we are where we are telling the world and we're telling ourselves what our integrity is really worth. What our relationship with God is really worth. And I, I realized what my integrity was worth one time when I was playing disc golf at this uh, tournament that I was playing in. Um, and my dad and I like to play disc golf. I don't know if any of you guys have ever played. It's exactly what it sounds like. It's, uh, it's like golf just thrown with frisbees and then you throw them into baskets. And at this one tournament, they had this thing uh, where there was a special, uh, b special basket and whoever had the best throw, the first throw and got closest to the pin would get a prize. And so uh, we all threw and I had a terrible first throw, atrocious. So bad, it was like almost no better than where I threw my first starting throw. It's an awesome feeling and I definitely took it well. But anyway, so that was terrible. My second throw was awesome. And I got it right under the basket. So about as good as the throws you could get without actually getting it in. And I was excited. Now at the end of the tournament, uh, at the end of the tournament, they announced the winner of closest to the pin. And they said it was me. I guess everyone forgot about my really, really terrible first throw. And I just stayed quiet because I liked the disc that was going to be free. And I was like, well, I did have a really good second throw. So I think that should count for something. And I stayed quiet for a $15 Frisbee. On that day, I realized my integrity apparently was worth a $15 Frisbee. And how many times do we realize maybe by our actions, what we're willing to trade for something so small. What we're willing to trade about who we are and what we, uh, who we are uh, can be so little. When you have integrity though, nothing else matters. When you have integrity, it doesn't matter what sort of little thing you may try to get. It doesn't matter what benefit, it doesn't matter what sort of short term reward. But when you don't have integrity, nothing else matters. Because whatever, when you, when you don't care, it's whatever is gonna be best in the moment. And you find yourself just taking shortcuts and cutting corners and falling into that trap over and over again. But Psalms 139, 23 said this, "'Search me, God, and know my heart. "'Test me and know my anxious thoughts. "'See if there is any offensive way in me "'and lead me in the way everlasting.'" I see what this is, and what this is is that, we see this is a challenging verse. Because the heart, our heart can be so deceitful to us sometimes, can't it? It, it deceives us into saying, you, you know, you, you want this. This is the right thing to do. It's going it, to be, it's gonna be great. As soon as you get this one thing, your life is going to be so much better. I heard someone put it this way. Show me where you are most defensive. And that is often, and that is often where you are most vulnerable. The place in your heart, the place in your life where if you feel like someone's starting to come close to you, you just clam up and your, your walls come up. That's in the part of your life where you're most vulnerable. Look at what you don't want other people to know. Look at what you criticize in others. And so often the thing that we criticize the hardest in other people, that is a reflection of the part of our life where we are the weakest. That's the area in our life where we are so nervous, but we see it in other people and, and we hate it. And these are the ways, the questions we ask ourselves. If you wanna see the places in your life where maybe we need to grow and to reflect more like God, 
where we need to look to. But I think the first step for us, if we don't want to live our life that way, is to acknowledge any area where actions are inconsistent with what we claim to believe. Look at the areas where we exaggerate, where we make other people look bad, where we criticize, where we gossip, the corners that we cut. And then we look at the place where we, where we claim to be spiritually and the things that we say we should do, or we look at the hidden sins in our life that we don't want anyone to know. And the best way to get rid of that in our life is to acknowledge it and to confess it and to let God cleanse and to change us. And that's so much of what I see what baptism is about. It's not about us saying, here I am, I am perfect. God, I want to show everyone that I have my life together, but it is saying, God, look at all the areas in my life that I need to change, and I am giving it over to you to change. I'm trusting in you to give me the power to not have to be that way anymore, to not, to not be selfish, to not have greed, to not be deceitful, to not be short-sighted. But so often, to get the things that we truly want, that we desire, we try to rely on who we are as a person. We look at the gifts that God gave us. And talent can take us to the top. But I heard someone say this, but only integrity will keep us there. How many people have we known or seen They had all the gifts in the world? And they did well, and they built a great life for themselves. But it was their own decisions that tore themselves down and where they lost all of the things that God blessed them with. But when we have integrity, nothing else matters. But when you don't have integrity, nothing else matters. At the end of the day, when I played that, uh, when I had that disc golf tournament, God spoke to me in my heart as I was standing there with my prized, uh, prized disc that I was so excited about. And I had another fight with that little inner voice. And I thought, I said, God, I'm going to be really embarrassed if I tell them I lied and I made a mistake uh, that I threw a really bad first throw. But God said, yeah, you will hate it, but maybe you will think about doing it. You'll think about it the next time you want to have something short term. And I heard God in my heart and he told me just to get up in front of everyone and say, you know what, guys, I had a bad first throw. You missed it. And this doesn't belong to me. And so I just walked on over and I gave that to the other person. And I wish I could say that there was some sort of really fun, happy ending to the story. I just got a lot of awkward looks and I got a really great lesson in my life that, you know, it pays to just be honest the first time. I did not find myself in that situation because my integrity is not worth a disc. I want my integrity who God has called me to be, to be so much more valuable than any short-term benefit, from any temporary gaining or thing along those lines. And sometimes it's really difficult to do the right thing because we don't know what the outcome is going to be like. But what I would say for us today as we're coming to a close is that what we need to learn to do, what I have to learn to do and continue to learn, is that we do what's right and we trust God with the results. Because it can be so easy to say, but God, if I do what is right, don't you see what's going to happen? Because our integrity is easier to keep than it is to recover. It's amazing how much better it is if we just do what's right at the beginning. So here in a moment, I want to go ahead and I want to pray, and I'll pray for, with all of you guys, and then we'll have Pastor Susan come up as we transition into a time of baptism together. And let's go, let's go ahead and bow our heads as we go before God today. Father, I thank you so much for this day. And I thank you, God, that you care and you love us so much. And thank you, Lord, that you don't just leave us to the way that we are. You don't just leave us in a place where, we're, where we live our lives, where we have to be full of pride and greed, Father, where we have to be short-sighted, Father. But you give us an opportunity to live a life like your son lived. As Jesus Christ was on this earth, that he spent, he lived his life perfectly with no sin, completely blameless, God, showing us that it is possible to, uh, that it is possible to do so. And I pray for anyone here today who wants to live the way they claim they believe, the way they do believe, God. And they want to have their life match the, the beliefs that they have in all areas of their lives. They want to be the same person on a Sunday morning as they are on a Friday night, God. Father, I pray for anyone 
who's feeling that way today. I pray for anyone who maybe as we're, talk, we're talking about this topic, their heart started to beat a little bit faster as you pointed out something in their life that they need to be honest about, that they need to confess. And God, I thank you that it is only by your power that we can change. And Father, I praise you and I thank you for that, for the amazing and unfathomable power that you give us, God. So God, I give that over to you. We thank you and praise you. And in Jesus' name, we all say together, amen. amen. We're going to go ahead and have Pastor Susan come up as she's going to transition us into the time of baptism, and she'll give us some instructions. Thank you so much. I'm going to read some scriptures first. Um, I want you to look at the lake, though, when I read this. This is about when Jesus came and John was baptizing. So think about Jesus coming in to being baptized, and it says... And so John came baptizing in the desert region and preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. The whole Judean countryside and all people of Jerusalem went out to him, confessing their sins. They were baptized by him in the Jordan River. John wore clothing made of camel hair with a leather belt around his waist, not flip-flops. <laughs> And he ate locusts and wild honey. And this was his message. After me will come one more powerful than I. I, I, sorry, the thongs of his sandals, I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. Look at John's attitude, how humble he was, knowing that Jesus was God's son, the one and only Lord. I'm not worthy to untie his sandals. I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. At this time, Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. As Jesus was coming out of the water, he saw heaven being opened, torn open and the spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven you are my son, whom I love. With you, I am well pleased. God's presence is here today. As we go to take Brook down to be baptized, we want to walk on that side, and we want to think God's presence is here. And think about what baptism means. It means an outward confession of our faith in the Lord Jesus. It is a celebration of God's presence, how God changes us and grows us and molds us. Think about it. We go down, and our sins are washed away and we come up to follow God. So let's follow Jesus today. Come on, Brooke. Everybody, we're gonna go over here, okay? Come stand up and walk over, please. presence, God, and we thank you for her life, God. Yes, we Lord. ask that you bless her, God, and guide her and keep her, God. Yes, for this day to be remembered, God, it's all about you, God. It's not about me. Yes. Father, I want to follow. And just like Pastor was talking today, Lord, we stumble, we fall. Father, you have grace, you have mercy, you have forgiveness. You cleanse us with that blood. Yes, and Father, we just give you Brooke today, Lord God. And we want to honor you today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Good for you. 
much today for what you're doing in Brooke's life yes. and we are so excited to be here with thank her you. to celebrate and to witness this moment yes. and we thank you God for the plan and the plan that you have for her life and that she is willing to come out in front of all these people that are here to celebrate with her and that you have a plan and she is dedicating yes. her life to you God thank we thank you when we celebrate the power that only comes for, from you God and God, I cannot wait to hear all the things that you do in Brooke's life yes. and the lives that she in turn is going to change as she follows after you, God, you, as she's going down this journey. And Father, we praise you for this. We celebrate with you and we all say together, Amen. Amen. We're so happy for you, Brooke. Congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> hey Brenda, would you give everyone some instructions? I don't know what time it is. <laughs> 